The Power Factor Show with Steve and Rick. Episode 6, USPSA, Hit Factors and Scoring. Gun Rights Radio Network has the best pro-Second Amendment, pro-gun rights podcast available on the net. The podcasts are absolutely free when subscribing using iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. Or if you want, you can just listen from the website. Make sure you visit gunrightsradio.com to subscribe. Podcasting freedom, one episode at a time. Okay, welcome to Power Factor. I'm Steve. And I'm once again Rick. Always. So today we're going to talk about something that probably has mystified a lot of shooters, which is how to score uh, USPSA stages, how they're, um, how they're shot, or I shouldn't say how they're shot, how they're scored on um, the different types of stages. Um, seems to probably be one of the main points that people complain about USPSA is that they can never figure out how to score it. So, And even as you're shooting, you have absolutely no idea how you're doing relative to anybody else until you see the scores posted. That's true. Yeah, and, and I will say that's probably one of the benefits of IDPA is that you know you can shoot it and I can shoot it assuming we're in the same division and you'll know what your score is immediately when uh, you're done and I'll know what my score is and we'll instantly know who won. Right. Uh, with the USPSA, it's a little more challenging than that. So, at any rate, um, so in terms of USPSA type stages, there's really three particular types of stages. There's um, what's called com stock, which is basically shoot as much as you want, take as long as you want, and at the end they take your points uh, divided by your time, which is what's your hit factor and that defines your performance for the score. And just out of a bit of information here, that the name Comstock actually comes from, do you know what the, actually the origin of it is? I don't, why don't you tell us? Well, okay, I'm glad you asked. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Walter Comstock who was out of Placerville, California, who created the name. Um, and Jeff Cooper, I think it was in 78, 76 or 78, but at any rate, mentioned the Comstock method of scoring of uh, taking the points divided by the time uh, to score stages. Now, it's interesting that that method really didn't become official until later. It wasn't immediately adopted, um, yet Cooper actually touted the advantages of, or the, the benefits, or whatever you want to call it, of, of Comstock scoring. So, at any rate, the next type of scoring is called Virginia count, and Virginia count basically is defined as only shoot a certain number of rounds, but take as long as you want to do it. So, an example of a Virginia count is the classic El Prez uh, classifier, which is uh, facing up range, turn, draw, fire two rounds per target. There's three rounds there, or three targets there. Fire two rounds per target, perform a mandatory reload, and shoot each target again with two rounds per target for a total of 12 rounds. So you fire 12 rounds, you take as long as you want to do it. Um, you are penalized for extra shots and extra hits on a target. So do you know where the origin of Virginia count came from? Somewhere in Virginia? You would be correct. Yeah, actually, it, it was originally up until the point of being called Virginia Count was called Limited Comstock, which is similar to Limited Vickers in IDPA speak. Um, in the 1983 uh, IPSC, at that time, Nationals, which were held in Virginia, um, they created the name then. They changed the name of Limited Comstock to Virginia Count. The reason for it is that back in the day, they didn't have shot timers. They had stopwatches. And the problem was, is that with a Comstock scoring, is a guy would shoot, and it's like, is he done? Is he done? And, and it's a classic, you know, he sees a target that he hasn't shot, and he turns and shoots that. Mm. So you'd have to run at least two or three stopwatches or something with it, at least the ability to do like a lap time and a cumulative time. So what they did is they said, okay, let's do Virginia count. When he fires 12 rounds or whatever, we know he's done. And you'll right. hit the stopwatch at that point and be able to record the time. So now today we have the shot timer, so it really doesn't matter when the guy stops shooting, you can record his last shot. But at any rate, that was really the push for Virginia count. So at any rate, here's another trivia question for you. I'm just full of it tonight. Okay. Yeah, so who won the uh, the U.S., I'm sorry, the Ipswich Nationals in 1983? 83. I'm going to say that was Rob Latham's first championship. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. <laughs> You would be correct. So, um, and the last last scoring is called fixed time, and fixed time scoring is really Virginia count, um, where you're firing a certain number of rounds, but you have a required amount of time to get to do it in. So, it'll be typically a lot of times you'll see this is on standard exercises and stuff like that. But you'll fire. Um, it'll say something like you know engage T1 through T3, 
and only shoot for five seconds or something like that. Well, we shot that uh, classifier just Re two last weekend, last, yeah. last yeah. weekend with right. the three timed fire strings, different requirements, different distances, but always five seconds on each string. So it's right. kind of interesting because the it can really you know you're testing it could be your reloading speed, your strong hand, your weak hand, all on the same stage, but with this uh, the timed fire aspect of it introducing some interesting challenges. And as I recall, you also shot a very good score in that. You actually went Grandmaster well, scoring for that particular not, it stage. Was, it turned out it was 90%. Well, that's Grandmaster. Yeah. Is it? Uh, mm -hmm. Wait a minute. No, it's not. It's 95. Yeah, yeah 95 right, right. right. But that's still the best class I've ever shot. It, it, it was an interesting stage. It was uh, just since we're talking about it, uh, 25 yards, two rounds each target, freestyle. Freestyle. Second string was one round per target. Reload. reload one round per target. One round per target in five seconds again. 15 yards. Yeah. And then the last string was two rounds per target. Strong hand strong only. Strong hand only, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was... It was oh, it, again in five seconds. Again in five seconds, yeah. yeah. And that was one of those deals where I remember, you know, even as recently as a couple of years ago, I would often just skip the reload on the mm. second string and just get three alphas, thinking there's no way I'm going to fire three do a reload and get off three more good aim shots. Right. And so I think this was the first time that I ever actually really shot it completely successfully, both in terms of my score and just completing the course of fire as written. So I was pretty, I was jumping up and down. Was, was <laughs> you know what? And one of the other interesting things about fixed time score, and we've seen this before, is that they'll tell you you have five seconds, but people don't really realize how long five seconds is. So they'll be pushing way too fast. It'll be like, you know, blah, 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 they get done. And about a second later, you know, beep, when the timer yeah. goes off, indicating five seconds. So they've really, I mean, rather than pacing themselves to shoot in a five-second pace, they shoot it in a four-second pace, and they're standing there for a second where they yeah. could have taken that time to get a better, you know, better sight picture or whatever the case may be. Yeah. The other interesting thing about a time fire, of course, is that you're not penalized for mics. So where a normal course of fire like a Comstock or Virginia count is if you have a miss on a target, you get penalized 10 points for that. Virginia count, they don't penalize you. I'm sorry, fixed time, they don't penalize you for um, for mics on target. So at any rate, so it's just po it turns out to be points. It's points. Yeah, yeah. who yeah. can get the most points? Points, in right? Five seconds. Right, right. So really, what it gets down to, like we mentioned before, is hit factors. Um, and the way I, I think what probably confuses a lot of shooters is to understand what hit factors are and how that really, how the hit factor then turns into a stage score, which then turns into a match score for the overall match. Now the first thing you gotta realize is that when you're in a particular division, you're not shooting against the guys in open, and you're not shooting, I'm sorry, you're not shooting in, in, in any of the people in either division. So if you're shooting production, for example, you're shooting against all the other guys in production, you don't care what the guys in open are doing, you don't care what the guys in limited are doing, you don't care what the other people are doing, you're strictly shooting against the other people in in production division. So what happens there is that you're, you shoot the course of fire and you have a certain amount of points and you have a certain amount of time and everybody else does the same thing. Hit factor is nothing more than dividing your points by your time and that defines your hit factor. So simple math here is that if you have let's say a, let's say the course of fire is 120 points, you shoot 100 points you do it in 10 seconds, your hit factor is 10, okay? Uh, somebody else comes along and, let's say, shoots 90 points. They do it again in 10 seconds for sake of math, and their hit factor is 9. So you have a 10 hit factor. They have a 9 hit factor. Um, you end up having a higher hit factor for that course of fire, and, and, and you are effectively beating them. Um, now, you get into this age-old argument of, you know, speed and time, and it's possible that somebody else may come along and not have as many points as you, but they may do it in a faster time than what you do it. So as an example, and I'm not certain here off the math and off of my head, but if you shot, let's say, rather than 100 points in 10 seconds, and somebody else comes along and shoots, let's say, 90 points in, say, just throw a number out there like seven seconds. Well, okay, so I can do this. 8.5 seconds, which would definitely be a higher than 10 hit factor. Use your math. Yeah. Because um, 9 would be, 90 over 9 would be, carry the two, carry the two, divide by, carry, yeah. Uh, would be a 10. But at any rate, so yeah, they, they would have a higher hit factor than you would. So sometimes actually shooting faster, dropping points, but doing it more quickly will actually beat somebody else who's who's a little more accuracy intensive. So once 
everybody has shot the a particular stage, and let's go back to our hypothetical 120 point stage. And just think how easy the math would have been if we'd have been a hundred point stage. Well, actually, I'm going somewhere with this, okay. so yeah. Right. So I shot a hundred points in ten seconds, and you shot, let's say, ninety points in ten seconds. Right. So you have a nine hit factor, and I have a ten hit factor, so I win. And let's say it's just us, you and I, shooting against each other. Right. So at that point there, I I win the stage. Okay, I have the highest hit factor. My ten hit factor beats your nine hit factor. The interesting thing about the way that stage scoring works is that the winner of the stage gets all of the stage points. Sort of like the electoral college of shooting. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very similar to that. Yeah. So even though I only shot 100 points and the stage is worth 120, I get all 120 of the stage points. Okay. So to figure out the number of points that you get, you take your hit factor and divide it by my hit factor, and your hit factor was 9, right. my hit factor was 10, so you get 90% of, of the points. On the stage. On the stage. So, so you get 90% of 120 points, which... For the stage score. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that, and that is your stage points. Right. Okay, and offhand, 90% of 120 is a number, less than 120. Eight or something. Yeah. Something like that. But at any rate, so that's your number of points for that particular stage. Okay. Right. Then we go into stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five, whatever the case may be. And it works the same thing for each of those stages. So the winner of the stage gets all the stage points, and all the rest of the people basically get a percentage of the stage points based on their hit factor relative to the stage winner's hit factor. And that's how many stage points they get. Okay. And at the end of the match, basically the way to figure out the, the match winner is that you take the stage points for all the individual stages, you sum them up, and basically whoever has the most stage points in a particular division is the winner. So granted, it's a little more difficult than IDPA, where an IDPA, shoot the stage, take your points down, add a half a second per point, add it up, and immediately you know on a given stage you know what your score is. In the case and like everybody's that. score is comparable. Because you've got this fixed time penalty. Right. So the guy who wins one division, you could say, you know, oh, he beat me by three seconds. Whereas you look at the guy who wins open and the guy who wins limited, you know, let's say the guy who won open won half the stages. The mm -hmm. guy who won limited won only two stages. Mm -hmm. They have completely different uh, match points. Right. And yet both of them win their division. And right. you can't compare the score of one division to another. Not directly. I mean, typically what they'll do... Um, or at least typically what I do is I like to just from a standpoint of calculate um, basically overall results. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll take everybody's results and base it off of the stage winner, whoever it may be, for any... Whichever games. division it may Whatever. be. Whatever. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter what division. It, typically it's going to be open, but it doesn't have to necessarily be open. But at right. any rate, and then calculate everybody's stage points based on the stage winner, whoever sure. it may be. But you'll ra you rarely, if ever, see... Something like that posted, and on in that, fact, or on a USPSA or... results say that you cannot do that. Right. The USPSA, right. the USPSA basically says that you cannot compare or try to compare shooters in different divisions. It literally needs to be broken out by division. So, but I do it from a standpoint of just giving a feel of how I'm shooting relative to everybody else yeah. and relative to the match winner. It kind of gives me just a you know warm, touchy feeling or whatever it is of how I'm shooting. Yeah, uh, relative yeah. to everybody else. So. so at any rate, but but the interesting thing about hit factors is there's actually a lot of information that be, can be gained from hit factors. So if you think about what hit factor actually is, is that it's, it's your points divided by your time, or another way to look at it is it's the amount of points per second. I mean, if you if, as an example of a 10 hit factor, you are getting 10 points per second. Now you can take the inverse of that and then say, that it's taking for every tenth of a second, I'm getting one point. Mm -hmm. And you can then start using that information to decide whether it's worthwhile to do a makeup shot on a given target. So um, as an example, using our target here, if you have a, a 10 hit factor stage, okay, so we're looking at, it's, it's Fred, our favorite target. Yeah. How you doing, Fred? Anyway, um, so you have a 10 hit factor stage, and let's say on a given target that you fire a C-zone hit, and let's say for sake of discussion we're shooting major power factor. Okay, 
So a C-zone hit is four points versus five points, or it's one point down. So on a 10-hit factor stage, the question is, is that you, you basically are looking at this situation where how long does it take to make up one point? It's a tenth of a second. Can you recognize the fact that you have a C-zone hit and in a tenth of a second, make up that shot and make it an A. I would question whether anybody could even do that. I mean, you literally have to recognize the fact that you did it, fire the makeup shot, and have it be an A, a hit. The recognition alone is probably more than 10 seconds. Exactly. So it's not going to happen. 10 second, yeah, yeah, right. So then you can start looking at, okay, well, let's say it's a, a D zone hit. Okay, well, a D zone hit is worth two points. So you're, Assuming we're still shooting major. Right, right, major, major power factor. So now you're three points down from the A zone. So now you, again, using a 10 hit factor or 0.1 points per second, you have roughly 0.3 seconds to recognize that you shot a D hit. So you need to recognize the fact that you did it and then make it up in 0.3 seconds. Again, I would probably say that most shooters are probably not going to do that. They just let it go at a 10 hit factor. The interesting thing there is that you need to look at this from the standpoint of what you can do. I mean, because some people may just not be able to make up that A zone hit that quick. But what your abilities are and what your accuracy is and how fast you can recognize something, what your split time is, basically your shot-to-shot -shot, uh, repetition time, um, and, and really realize whether you're even capable of doing that. So let's, let's scale this down and let's say it's a five hit factor stage. Okay, so five hit factor stage is, is basically... Um, what, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 seconds per point, okay? So you go back to your C zone hit, which is one point, point or one point down, at, at 0 0.2 seconds per point, can you make that up in 0 0.2? Probably not, again, it's not worth it. On a D zone hit, now we're looking at three points down at 0 0.2 seconds per point. You're looking at a 0.6 seconds to make up that. The question is, depending on the difficulty of the target, how far out it is, this, that, and the other thing, you really get no shoot right here. Exactly, exactly. Of whether it's worthwhile to make up a, a D zone hit at a, a five hit factor. Maybe, maybe not. It, it's hard to say. If you start going down lower and lower in terms of hit factor, let's say it's a three hit factor stage. Okay, so now you're looking at, at roughly 0.33 seconds per point. A D zone hit now is roughly a second to recognize it and make it up. Yeah, you can probably do that. You can probably actually make up that hit in a one-second time, and it, it will probably be beneficial for you to do that. Generally speaking, in something that, that Rob Latham um, talks about, and he's published actually a very interesting article on hit factors that used to be, or probably actually still is available on his Rob Latham uh, website in a section called Ask Rob, but at any rate, he goes through and analyzes hit factors. And basically what Rob says is that that he will probably never make up a C zone hit regardless of hit factor for a given stage, no matter what it is, whether it's 10, 5, 3, whatever, he won't make up a C. And in a D zone hit, he will not make it up at a 5, but probably will consider making it up at a 3 hit factor. So it's something to be aware of. And this gets into also calling your shots. I mean, the, the thing on calling your shots is that when you fire a round, you know immediately where on the target that round hit the hit on the scoring area, and you know if it's a C or a D or a mic or whatever, and you can immediately make it up. But if your method of shooting is shoot and look for bullet holes in the target to see where they hit, there's too much time lost there to actually make up or do anything or recognize the fact that you have fired around out of the critical A zone and try to make it up. So in, in that situation like that, you really need to work on calling your shots, recognize where they are on the target, and then know what to do with it once you've fired that round. Here's a tip from Rick. On the uh, unload show clear, hammer down part of the course of fire, uh, you'll find that some guns have a, what's called a magazine disconnector, which means the, the trigger hammer mechanism is disconnected when the magazine is withdrawn from the gun. Uh, there's some guns that even two different models of an otherwise identical gun, some will have the disconnector, some won't. Classic example is a Browning High Power. Without a magazine in place, the hammer won't drop. You must either put an empty mag in the gun to get it to drop, or in this case, depending if you've got a dexterous finger, you can get up there and trip it and drop it that way. 
if at the start of the course of fire on the load and make ready command, if you have a magazine in which you've loaded just one round, when you load your gun, you'll uh, put the mag in the gun, cycle it, eject that empty magazine, put it in your pocket, load your gun, and then at the end of the course of fire, you can use that empty mag that you used at the start to drop the hammer. It might be a good idea to, to let the ranger safety officer know that you, hey, I've got an empty magazine. You can confirm that it's empty before you put it in the gun. Drop the mag. Be sure to take the mag out again before you holster. Okay, the other concern is as you're doing these calculations in your mind, should I take an extra shot, you know, because I've got a half a second to do so, remember also that these shots aren't free and that if you take an extra shot and you're shooting a revolver or shooting in single stack division, you don't necessarily have a shot to spare. Um, if you find yourself having to do first uh, slide lock reloads and then static reloads because right. you've taken an extra shot, the half second that you saved by making up this delta now turns into a two second penalty on a reload that came later that you didn't expect to have to do. So you really have to take a number of things into consideration beyond just this point per time because there's knock on effects to any, any the possible knock on effects to any extra shots you take. Yeah, that's a very good point, um, and, and I think that's one of the uh, the things that, you know, a lot of the stuff, discussion on hit factors, most people just come into the stage and they're just happy if they can hit all the, you know, the freaking targets in the, at a given amount of time, um, and they don't concern themselves with hit factors. So I think what we're discussing here is that once you understand what hit factors mean and how you can use them, that's when you can start applying it. But in, at the beginning level, this whole entire discussion of hit factors is probably something that's like, and it's good to know, and someday it'll come along and it'll apply, and you can or sort of click and you can start applying it. Um, but in the very beginning, you know, it, it, a lot of this stuff may just be so confusing that you really don't know how to use it or, or, or what to do with it once you understand that knowledge. The other thing is also to understand when figuring out hit factors is that what this discussion revolves around is it's is your time to shoot the stage, not somebody else's time. So, you know, I may shoot a stage and get a 10 hit factor, and some other guy may come along, and, and his best performance in the stage is a 3 hit factor, but he can't base his numbers or his calculation, the way to approach the stage based on what I can do. He needs to approach it really on what you can do. That's a critical thing in understanding of what to do. So well, a lot of times what I'll come into of a stage and figure out what the hit factor is, is I'll say, okay, there's a guy that I recognize who is basically at my shooting level. Let's see what his time is when he runs it. And, and you can get a, a feel for the time that way. Or the other way to do it is kind of a visualization thing. A lot of times, and I usually carry a watch that has a sweep second stopwatch hand on it, I'll close my eyes and literally go through the sequence of basically visualizing shooting the stage. And you go through and you, you know, pretend like you're shooting all the targets and do your movement and do your reloads and this, that, and the other thing. And you get to the end, hit your stopwatch and look at it. Now, typically, the problem there is that you usually run a little bit faster than what you actually do. Um, so you usually may need to add maybe like 10% or whatever to your time unless you're really good at doing this and after a time you'll, with experience you'll really understand how to do this better. Um, but that'll give you an idea of what your time actually is for a stage and then say okay well given the amount of points that there are and you usually figure you're going to drop some um, better than anyway, So drop some points, you know, give yourself 90 to 95% of the points that you're going to shoot and you can come up with your own personal hit factor for a given stage and, and you know, use that information to your advantage. Um, now, one of the other things, and, and we have an interesting stage coming up here uh, for the Northwest Challenge, which is going to be held in July, is a stage um, called Trey Gumbas. And what that is, and we'll put a... a Gumbas? Oh, Gumbas or you know, whatever. How would you pronounce that? In your best that's, Italian. That's, it's supposed to be Goombas. This is like a, a kind of a gangster theme. Right. Not gangsta, right. but gangster themed match. So these are the Goombas. Yeah. So anyway, now I, I believe through the miracle of modern technology. Right about now. The image. It's the right image here. Trey Goombas should be there for all to see. One, two, three steel, and then four drop. Yeah, okay. 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 So what this stage is, is that um, it has three pieces of steel that activate four drop turning disappearing targets. Now a drop turning disappearing target basically means that you're not penalized for misses that you have on that target if you, if you miss it or you fail to shoot at it or whatever the case may be. The interesting thing about this stage is that it, it, 
it, it generates a lot of discussion about what the best way or what the fastest way or what the highest hit factor is possible that you can shoot for this stage. Um, I personally believe that the best way to explain, explain, why don't we just read the procedure? Sure, why don't you go ahead and so do we that. see what we've got here. So this is a, a Comstock stage, I mean you can shoot as much Fire as you want, round, yep. uh, at least theoretically and one, seven rounds. One thing with the, with the Comstock, or I should say one thing here is that whenever you see steel, it will always be a Comstock course of fire. You will never right. see steel in a Virginia count course of fire because the number of rounds are restricted, and if you miss, oops, now what? I mean, you can't fix it. So. Right. So each steel target is worth five points. Each paper target is engaged with a minimum of one round. Right. So it's a total of seven times five, or 35, 35 points. points. Right. Um, so the stage procedure is start position, standing in box, Facing down range, and the box we just determined is at ten yards. Well, we don't really we're, know. We don't really but I'm know. Assuming that it, we're going to guess, it can't yeah. be any closer than eight. It can't, right? Yeah. Right. So, so the box we figure is going to be ten yards from the steel. Um, facing down range, handguns loaded and holstered. On start signal, engage targets as visible from the box only. Each popper activates the two paper targets adjacent to it. As you can see in the illustration, the lines connect from the uh, steel poppers to the uh, paper disappearing targets behind them. Uh, T1 through T4 are disappearing targets. So when you hit pepper popper 1, it will activate both T1 and T2. And when you hit, if you then go to uh, pepper popper 2, the middle one, the middle one, it will activate T3 because, of course, 2 had already been activated by pepper popper 1. Assuming you hit 1. Assuming you hit 1. And then when you go to 3, pepper popper 3, it will activate T4 because assuming you hit Pepper Popper 2, right. T3 has already been activated. Now, let's start discussing the permutations of yeah. the, the engagement sequences and, and whatnot that are possible. Right. So, um, clearly you can see here that there are, you can shoot right to left, you can shoot right to left, right, you can shoot middle out, whatever the case may be. The interesting thing here about this stage is that these drop turners are typically the ones that come down and drop and wobble and present themselves a couple times. Some drop turns, you'll see them all sorts of different flavors. Some will come down, turn, face once, and then drop and go completely out of view. Uh, at the particular club where this is going to be shot, the ones that I know they have, I think they present themselves two or three times, but they come down, they kind of wobble and do those all sorts of different presentations. Um, but basically what you're looking at here, there's a maximum of 35 points. Um, that can be gained on this stage. It is my belief that the, and again, this is my strategy, how I think it possibly could be shot, but my belief is that the best way to shoot this stage is to draw and shoot the three steel, pep, steel pepper poppers, the activators, and stop at that point and not shoot anymore. The reason being is that I think it's possible to actually shoot and drop those three pepper poppers, assuming that you're on and you hit all of them in about 1.5 seconds. So I'm figuring roughly about 1.2, maybe a little bit less than that again, because these targets are at 10 yards. And again, this is at my skill level of what I think I'm capable of doing for somebody else. They may be able to go faster. Somebody else may be able to go slower. I don't know, but for my particular level, the way I'm going to approach it, or at least what I'm thinking for my case, is I'm going to draw and hit those three pepper poppers very quick and think I can probably do the first one in about 1.2. Assuming I can transition quick onto the second one in about 0.2 seconds, give or take. That's going to be 1.4. Again, another transition to the last one at 0.2 seconds or so, give or take. That's 1.6. So I'm just going to make it easy math of 1.5 seconds. So I've hit basically three targets for a total of 15 points in 1.5 seconds for a 10 hit factor. Okay. So you start looking at that and say, 10 hit, assuming I can do it in a 10 hit factor, if you were going to shoot the paper, what would it take to get a 10 hit factor on all the paper? Well, if assuming that you were able to hit all the paper and get alphas, and get alphas you would have to do it in 3.5 seconds. So what you're looking at now is transitions from target to target to target on targets that are wobbling and dropping and doing all sorts of things that may not pre be presenting themselves to you at the exact moment that, that when you transition onto them, which means you're going to have to either wait for that target to present itself to you or transition to a different target and shoot it and then go back to the first one. And it's my belief 
that the amount of time you're going to be either waiting for a target to present itself or transition from target to target is going to far outweigh just shooting those three pepper poppers, the steel targets, and leaving them alone. Now, some other people believe that it is possible to actually go off and hit those three poppers and then go and fire some rounds, maybe all the rounds, on the drop-turning targets and pick up something. But again, every drop-turning target, you have to transition from the steel to it and get that target the exact moment presenting itself to you at the right instant for you to fire around on the target and hit the A zone to do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of calculations that are going on here in order to figure out how to game this stage or how to shoot it most efficiently. And again, it's at your level. I mean, if you don't think that you can hit these poppers quickly is what I'm discussing, then it may be in your best interest to actually go off and, and try to go for the drop turns to get points. Because what I'm discussing here basically means that I need to draw and fire three rounds almost instantly on these things using effectively point shooting, no time to sit there and really confirm my sights are indexed on the target, but use point shooting all the way and hope that I hit these things. Hope. You mean expect. Yeah. Now the other issue, of course, is Steve's analysis of the stage is based on his expectation or, or his hope. possible <laughs> hope and dream of drawing and hitting these three poppers at 10 yards in one and a half seconds. When uh, a mutual friend of ours sent us this uh, diagram and we looked at it, Steve immediately said, you know, I'd shoot the three steel and, and, and just leave everything else and do it in one and a half seconds. I looked at it and said, well, that looks like a three-second stage to me. Um, the idea that you're going to draw and knock down three poppers at one and a half seconds, um, uh, I'm sure somebody is going to do that. I mean, when we look at the match results after I hope the match is it. over, somebody <laughs> will have got off their first three shots in 1.5 seconds. But I think more realistically, um, uh, ensuring that you get your three hits, reasonable draw time, I, I think two and a half seconds is, is more like it. And for uh, the average shooter, three seconds is probably more like it. And then you have to recalculate now with your hit factor not being 10. Now your hit factor is 5. Mm -hmm. And so now you have to decide, okay, if I've got 20 more points in play on the four paper targets with a hit factor of 5, What's the likelihood that I can knock those get get those twenty points in four seconds, or even sixteen points yeah. in four seconds? And that's a more realistic challenge. Sure. I mean, the person who right. can get the three steel in three seconds, um, you know, is is probably got a better chance of, of getting their points on the drop turners. But again, that assumes that all the planets align, and in this case, not the planets, but the targets that they're exposed to you when you want to engage them. If you're if if you're unable to go really from right to left or left to right, um, if you have to transition to a target and then leave it because it's disappearing, transition to another target that's appearing, come back to the target that you left if it does in fact you know have a second exposure. Um, you know after you're halfway through, you might have decided, well, I should have just stuck with the three steel after all. You know? Right. But it's one of those things where you you have to have a plan and then probably stick to it, because if you abandon it midway through, you're probably not going to get the advantage of the points or the speed. You know, I think the, the other thing that's really interesting here to look at is that most people who don't, don't understand hit factors will go into the stage and go, I'm going to shoot the steel, and then I'm going to shoot the paper. Yeah, because that's what it says. It's, it's just shoot the steel, steel and shoot and the, paper. the paper. But yeah. the thing is that I think the point that we're trying to make here is that once you start understanding hit factors and what they mean, you can start looking at stages like this, or other stages, or similar stages, or whatever, and really decide basically maybe your best game plan is not to do everything that you possibly could do. I mean, in this particular stage, I believe the best game plan is to shoot three steel and stop. Somebody else who has come up with a plan may think that it's best to shoot the three steel and try to fire some rounds at the paper. And other people who haven't even analyzed the hit factor at all may just come in and says, well, it says shoot the three steel and then shoot the four paper, so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I, I think the point is of all this discussion, and I realize you guys are probably saying, you know, okay, what's the point of all this stuff, is that there is a point of actually knowing with the hit factor and what you can do with it um, that may actually change your approach of how to shoot a stage. And I think that's the one advantage of hit factors over IDPA scoring, is that IDPA scoring is that you shoot the stage, you take your points down, you add a half a second, but it really doesn't tell you in some cases, what your strategy for a particular stage is, should be or could be or whatever the case is. And hit factor, knowing a hit factor, it can tell you not only in some cases of what your strategy is to shoot the stage, 
whether it's a accuracy intensive stage, which I usually define as basically hit factor of probably less than five, or if it's a speed intensive stage, which is typically an accuracy, I'm sorry, hit factor of something higher, maybe eight, nine, 10, when you start seeing things like that, um, it's basically, it's all about speed. Um, and once you know this stuff, it can kind of change your approach of how to shoot a stage. But if you don't understand hit factors and what they mean, you just go into every single stage and think, well, all I got to do is shoot targets and hit points, you know, and, and that's all there is to it. Um, but once you know this information, I mean, an example of this that we've seen before is that a shooter will come into a last target and they fire one round and they go and run their gun dry. So they immediately go off and do the reload and it takes about two seconds or whatever to do the reload, okay? Well, the thing is, is that that two seconds that they took to do the reload, depending on the hit factor, if the hit factor is, um, let's say, five hit factor or whatever, by, by the hit factor of five, basically you're looking at five points per second, okay? By not shooting at the target, that's five points that they didn't get for the, for the hit on the target plus a 10-point miss penalty, so you're looking at 15 points. Well, that means basically 15 over five hit factor means they got three seconds to do it. Well, nearly everybody can pull off a reload in three seconds, so it really is in your benefit to go off and do the reload and hit that target. But let's say it's a 10 hit factor stage, okay? So a 10 hit factor stage, you basically have to, again, 15 points divided by 10, you've got to pull off a reload and hit the A zone at 1.5 seconds. Unless it's right in front of your face and you know what to do right when you see that happening, you're probably not going to be able to pull off a 1.5 second reload. But instinctively, everybody goes into this situ situation where they run their gun dry and they go, oh, I need to fire another round. Well, maybe it's not in your best interest to fire that other round. Mm -hmm. From a competition standpoint, this is stuff that you need to be aware of that you can calculate and know up front whether or whether or not it really is in your best interest to go off and, and do certain things in a given course of fire. Yeah. I mean, I, I shot a match on Sunday where I, I actually had a miss on a target that was not much more than arm's length away. But it was, I'd broken the stage down since I was shooting single stack into eight, reload, eight, reload, eight. And I decided that time it would take me to do a slide lock reload on the next array right. was going to, met picking up the mic wasn't worth, wasn't it, worth even it. though I was looking at that big hole, smoking hole in the, in the black paint. I just said, okay, I'm going to waste more time um, on my reload than I'm going to gain in points by re-engaging this target. And, you know, again, if I were shooting open and I had 30 rounds in the gun and I was blazing through it, I, of course I would have made it up. You know, I mean, it was right there. I probably would have just gone blam, blam without even thinking about it. Um, but it's just, again, you know, how, what, but the guy who was shooting open would have a different hit factor to base his right. calculation on. Right. So, right. you know, I'm looking at a hit, I'm doing my calculation maybe based on hit factor of seven. The guy shooting open, he might be basing on a hit factor of 10 or something. So, again, it, you can't ask somebody else what's the hit factor on this stage. Because that's know? their hit factor, that's not their your hit factor. Hit factor right? yeah. It changes with division and with skill level. Right. So, in that particular instance, did you actually pre-calculate your hit factor or what the hit factor could be on that stage? Or did you just kind of have a gut feeling? Because, I mean, it was gut from feeling. our standpoint, we've been yeah. shooting long enough that we know, you know, from a gut feeling of how, many, how long it takes, how many points are there. You know, you kind of get a feeling for what it actually is. But you just kind of know that it's probably just not worth my best interest to go off and do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, it, it, it was just it was something that precisely because the target was literally at arm's length. Yeah. That's that's why it, you know I, I just the the, the decision um, it's not anything I'd planned for. If it had been a target, let's say it was a steel target at thirty yards, I fire a shot at it and miss it. Then it's kind of a different issue because. How long is it going to take me to make up the shot? Is right. a little bit different. I mean, this was just could have been a blam blam, but even at that, I just decided now if I got to do a static reload or slide lock reload further along because of this, it's not going to be worth it. Right, right. So I think it's the point here is that you really need to actually, you know, take into consideration what hit factors mean, what they tell you about a stage, um, and start doing this math just up front just to get a feel for you know what the hit factor for a stage is. Um, in preparation for, you know, further down the road. I mean, right now it may not benefit you that much, but it's really interesting to actually see what you can do with hit factors because you got to realize that a majority of the people that are out there shooting are not paying attention to hit factors at all. They have no clue what they mean. They have no clue really what it, what it actually, how it affects them. And it's, you know, one more tool in your toolbox in terms of if, if, if um, you know, if, if it comes down to winning a stage or winning a match or whatever, 
sometimes knowing this information really can be key in knowing what to do and when to do it, um, and, and it can really benefit you, so. Yes. Okay, so uh, with that, I also actually want to take a moment here and uh, thank uh, the donors uh, for generous donations toward the program. Uh, we've received uh, uh, actually um, quite a few uh, donations and really want to uh, thank you guys for doing that. Hopefully you've received something out of the programs here and hopefully today we've actually uh, maybe made USPSA scoring a little less voodoo than what it actually has been in the past. So. Yeah. With that, uh, you can uh, hit the, if you have any, actually any, any further questions about this stuff or how to apply it or whatever, uh, you can contact us at powerfactorshow at gmail.com or hit us at the website at powerfactorshow.com. Um, any closing comments? Gaba gaba hey. <laughs> okay, I'm Steve. I'm Rick. That's the way it is.